Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be with you today. I'm Tony with the Unstuck Group, and I'm going to introduce some of my teammates as well as we get started today. Uh, today's webinar, it's focused on data numbers. I mean, guys like me, we love stuff like this. Uh, and I thought no one, no one besides me is going to be interested in this topic, but I know hundreds of you have registered to join us today. We're going to be looking at our lat latest data that we collect each quarter at the Unstuck Group and share some of the benchmarks that we're seeing and some of the latest trends as well. And uh, we're thinking you might enjoy this because every time we share this information, uh, there's all kinds of conversation and questions that pop up on social media. So I'm expecting today's conversation will be a good one as well. Uh, now, uh, just to put your minds at ease, we're not going to go through every stat in the report. In fact, we are going to talk about some of the numbers. Uh, but I wanted today's conversation to be more of the story behind the numbers. And so that's where I'm hoping the conversation will go. However, we will provide all of the data in a report to you at the conclusion of today's webinar. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to introduce some of the folks from my team. In fact, I think this is the very first webinar that we've done where it's only the Unstuck Group team. So let me introduce uh, some of my friends to you. First of all, Sean Bublett. Sean is also going to be helping to facilitate some of today's conversation. Uh, say hello to everyone, Sean. Hey, everybody. Yeah, Thanks so for Sean, us yeah. Sean, Sean uh, has uh, more than 12 years ministry experience in uh, various roles, including weekend services, art senior leadership at uh, Community Christian Church in Naperville, Illinois, in the Chicagoland area, a great multi site church there, and also Granger Community Church near South Bend, Indiana. Also joining us today is Amy Anderson. Amy is our Director of Consulting at the Unstuck Group. Amy, it's good to have you. Good to be with you all from the beautiful state of Minnesota. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, she uh, uh, has, uh, gosh, many, many years of ministry experience at Eagle Brook Church in the Twin mm -hmm. Cities of Minneapolis. And uh, she was on the team, senior leadership team, as the church grew from about a, thousand, a few thousand people to over 20,000. So. Uh, it's good to have her experience part of the conversation today. And I also want to introduce Michael Moore. <clears throat> Michael is the executive pastor of Faith Chapel Christian Center. It's in the Birm Birmingham area, great non-denominational church. Michael, it's good to have you part of the conversation as well. Thanks, Tony. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, so behind the scenes, we have a couple people helping us, uh, but primarily I want you to know about Tiffany. Tiffany DeLucia uh, is going to be helping us with Q&A today. And in fact, if you, would, if, we're, if you were to scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you could submit a question and we have dedicated time at the end of today's webinar to respond to questions. Some of you may also want to participate on social media, and uh, we, of course, welcome that on Twitter or Facebook. You can use the hashtag Unstuck Church. And so with that, Sean, I think that's all the preliminary. Sean, is this your very first webinar with the This Unstuck is my first Church? webinar. Welcome. It's good Thank to have you. you. And Thank I can't you. believe on your very first webinar, we're giving you the reins. So uh, you won't mind if periodically I take back the reins, will you? I don't mind at all, but you won't mind either if I throw you some hard questions, right? I'll do my best to respond. All right. All right. Good. <laughs> all right. So let's start here. Let's start out with some good news, shall we? Uh, okay. there, there are several really encouraging things that we've seen on the current report, uh, specifically in the ministry reach portion of our data. So Tony, First question from you. We saw overall attendance, uh, the average attendance, increase slightly by 1.3%. What do you make of the attendance numbers from this quarter's report? Yeah, so uh, it's encouraging from the data to see attendance still increasing uh, because we do know uh, from all the additional research that we're monitoring as well that there's no doubt about it, people are attending church less frequently. And so for us to see any 
increase in attendance, much less uh, we were expecting it's going to be plateaued or because uh, uh, people are attending less frequently, we expect always to see some decline in attendance numbers. Um, but it's there is a slight increase still happening, at least in the churches that we're engaged with. And so uh, I think this is good news. Uh, I mean, it's good, it's good for us in the church to hear. People will still attend church services. That will still happen. Uh, but the key questions I think we need to be asking then, are we still creating compelling worship experiences that people want to participate in and that people want to invite their friends to? And so I think that's one of the key questions that we have to continue to ask ourselves. And then if people are attending less frequently, and again, we know this to be the case from the data that we're seeing, um, the, the next question is uh, that the questions we need to be asking ourselves as church leaders is this, are we, in addition to measuring attendance, also measuring engagement? In other words, how are people engaging, connecting and engaging in the ministry of the church? Are they participating in groups? Are they participating in serving opportunities? Are they giving? Are they contributing to ministries outside the walls of the church? And even if attendance is plateaued or declining in some instances, we need to be monitoring engagement to know that the reach of our ministry is continuing to extend, particularly not only with the people that are already connected to the church, but beyond the walls of our church churches as well. And the other thing I would add too is if people are, are attending churches less frequently, we do need to be more intentional about online options that are available. And not only for on, online services, but also other options for people to take next steps. And for those steps, not only to be live experiences online, but on demand as well. So those, those are the, some of the things um, that uh, Sean, I, I guess, uh, again, good news that attendance is still increasing, uh, but I think some key questions that we need to be asking still related to attendance. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Amy, question for you. Another yeah. reach metric we saw that stood out was related just specifically to service styles. Um, less than one in four churches still offers a traditional service. Why do you think that is? Well, I do think that's a good trend, that it's moving in the right direction. It goes back to what Tony was saying, is that we have to design experiences that are going to draw new people to church. And when I think about traditional services, I'm just going to say this through the lens of an evangelist. And some of you have probably heard me say this before, but I think the weekend service is still the biggest front door for people who are checking out God and checking out faith. And I respectfully say that traditional services rarely reach new people to faith. Um, those services were designed hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago, some of those service elements. And they did that because how they did church was to reach their communities. Well, in these hundreds of years, our communities have changed quite a bit. Um, and I, the, the service just has not caught up with that. And I do a lot of secret shoppers. And I was just at a couple of churches this past few months with a traditional service. And my general experience was this. Uh, first, there was a bunch of people who were mingling around at the beginning of the service, and then they started to sing songs with lyrics that I did not understand. Um, then there were some group readings where it was kind of almost sounded like, again, to an outsider, people droning through something. We sat, we stood, um, and then I was rarely welcomed or guided through that experience to know what was to expect. And so my takeaway was these were nice people who seemed to enjoy whatever I just experienced, but it just confirmed that church wasn't the place for me. And, you know, I gave it one hour to try to reconnect with church or maybe come for the first time. But when I have an experience like that, it just doesn't feel relevant. And I don't think people come back. So all that to say, I think that we're reducing um, the number of traditional services is good. But I also saw that 28% are still trying to blend contemporary and traditional together. And Blended services kind of have the same experience. It's kind of like if you've got a vegan and a meat eater and you say, well, we can't just have meat or veggies, so let's blend it all together. Uh, no one really has the experience that they want. So um, I, I continue to encourage churches that the churches that we see that are healthy and that are growing, they have one service style and they've designed it around both the people they're trying to reach and the believers that they're trying to help grow up and take next steps in their faith. They design that service, they do it with as much excellence as they can, and then they repeat it as many times as they can because 
people are so busy these days. And so if you've got a church service at 930, that may not work for everybody every weekend. So then they've got an 11 o'clock, maybe they can go to same service. Um, and maybe even on a Saturday night at four or five o'clock. So growing churches tend to have one style and repeat it as much as they can. All right, well, we're gonna kind of shift focus from the reach aspects of the Unstuck Church Report to looking at ministry connection. And uh, so with that, uh, actually, Michael, I want you to respond to this first question. It is interesting looking at the data of this past quarter. Um, we saw one in six churches has discontinued membership or some partnership type of commitment. And I'm curious, uh, what's your take on that shift that's starting to take place? And do you think that's going to be a growing trend going forward? Yeah, um, I'm not surprised by the uh, one in six um, churches who discontinued the membership commitments. Um, it's about 16%. My take on it is I do believe in the next three to five years that that 16% uh, will continue to grow, that that percentage will continue to increase, um, primarily for two reasons. Um, one, a lot of the churches that uh, we consult and work with at the Unsuck Group, uh, they're, they're wanting to reach a younger demographic. They're wanting to either reach younger families um, or young adults, period. And a lot of millennials, a lot of the younger generation um, want to be engaged. They want to connect in community. They want to serve um, both inside of the church and outside of the, of the church, but they tend to shy away um, from that formal membership commitment, especially especially up front or especially um, in the beginning. And so um, I think as we see more churches continue to want to reach a younger demographic, um, even if it's something that they track in the background, I think that they'll begin to prioritize some other metrics uh, similar to what you referred to in your portion, um, which is centered around engagement. Um, uh, how many people are supporting our mission through their finances? How many people are supporting our mission through their time? Um, and I think we'll see that trend continue to increase because as a church leader, specifically for me, and I, I know that others can attest to it, uh, getting information about engagement tells us a lot more about the health of our churches uh, than just who's crossed that, that line of, of membership commitment. Um, several years ago in, in my home church, we decided to uh, see if we could clean up that membership commitment number. And when we began to look at our original membership uh, number through the filter of engagement, how many people were giving, uh, how many people were serving, how many of that roster were actually connected in community, uh, we saw the membership number actually drop by about 50%. Mm -hmm. um, when we looked at the actual number of people who were engaged. So from the usefulness of the data, plus as churches continue to, to drift toward reaching a younger demographic, I think that they're going to continue to prioritize engagement numbers over membership commitment numbers, and I, and I would encourage them to do so. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's very good, Michael. Tony, so another question for you, just uh, as we're talking about engagement here. Um, in this quarter's report, we saw both small group participation and volunteering were up from the last report. So how, how do you interpret that? Is that just all good news? Well, it can be good news. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe the best and assume it's good news. Uh, people are taking steps of maturity. Uh, that means they're also connecting in biblical community through groups. They're also using the spiritual gifts God's given them, and they're serving more in the church. I'm going to believe the best. But as leaders, we also have to look at information like that with a bit of caution and make sure we're asking all the questions. And as more people take steps of maturity, just making sure we're also continuing to connect with people that are on the very front end of their spiritual maturity or maybe not even yet have uh, committed their life to Jesus. And so sometimes when we're working with churches and we see high percentages of small group participation and volunteer numbers, but the church is in decline as far as attendance, that raises a red flag. And it's even a higher red flag than when we see the baptism numbers are also down. Because what that suggests is we, we have people that love Jesus and they're taking steps of spiritual maturity. It's being reflected in how they invest their time and their resources in the church, being in connection with the ministry of the church, 
But if we're not reaching new people and new people aren't giving their life to Jesus, then that raises a red flag and all of those next steps are good. But we also have to make sure the church continues to remain outward focused as well. And so it may not surprise uh, folks that are listening, but it's not uncommon for us to go into a church that's either in the maintenance phase of the life cycle or preservation phase and find they actually have very strong uh, numbers when it comes to smaller group connections and volunteer numbers, but the church is still in decline. And the reason why is, although there's high percentage engagement there, uh, people are not inviting their friends, new people aren't coming, guests are way down as far as first time guests to the church, and the church has kind of lost its outward focus. So we just need to make sure the front door remains open as we also see that increase in ministry connections, Sean. Yeah, really good. So following this conversation about volunteer engagement, I think we also need to have a conversation about ministry staffing in particular. And in the report, we have several different key pieces of data about staffing. Amy, a question for you on one of these. Um, churches are increasingly leaning on part-time staff. Mm -hmm. The average church has 56% of their staff working part-time. That's wow. up for, from 50% last year. By comparison, the national average is 17% of part-time workers, according to the Department of Labor. So mm -hmm. help us interpret that. Is this a good thing, a bad thing, just a thing? What is it? Well, I think generally when we're looking at part-time hours, um, if that's a growing number at your church, that's probably not a sign of health within your church. You're most likely uh, paying someone to do what volunteers should be doing at your church. Um, when we see high part-time numbers at a church, it indicates that we're hiring people to do things at the church versus hiring people to lead people to do things at the church. And in other words, we're very big on the Ephesians 4 model that the pastors and teachers are there to equip God's body to do the ministry of the church. And so if you're seeing that climb, just a couple things that I would um, raise for you. Number one, you have to assess if you have leaders in your leadership positions. Meaning, you know, when I see churches, especially that are growing from that 500 to 1000 mark and that those years of growth, that growth is hard. There's a lot of people, you know, ministries getting a little messy. That's usually when we start to exercise this, well, let's just hire someone part-time muscle. And so we end up hiring part-time in all these pockets of our church. And all of a sudden we're a fairly large church and we've hired a lot of people who are great at doing things, but we haven't hired the leaders to lead the ministry into the future. So I think you kind of have to assess do we have leaders in leadership positions? Because if you do, you'll see that behavior that they're raising up additional leaders and giving and empowering even volunteer leaders to take and to run with ministry. Um, and if this is a problem, the best book that I've ever read on this is called Design to Lead by Eric Geiger and Scott Peck. And I loved one of, their pers one of his perspectives. He said, a church is a community of gifted people, not a community of people with a gifted pastor. So... Mm -hmm. We have to break, you have to break this, um, this habit of hiring because what happens is the church culture actually just starts to expect if we want some ministry done, we just have to hire someone where really God's kingdom is the reverse of that, which is we as a church body are the ones who ought to be leading and equipping the body to do the entire ministry. So I would say that's not a healthy trend. I hope it goes the other direction. Uh, and as what Tony just talked about with serving numbers overall, typically when there's a lot of part-time people, serving numbers are also typically pretty low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Tony, excellent. You'd add to that? Yeah, or, no, uh, it, does, uh, it, de it does beg the hardball follow-up question though. Does that mean uh, churches should just start firing the part-time staff, Amy? Hmm, what do you think, Sean? No. <laughs> 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 it's a process, but I will say the first thing is to turn off that spigot, stop doing it and start assessing where you have leaders in your church and see how you can deploy those, those resources. Good, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tony, continuing the ministry staffing conversation, the other thing that we noticed in this report is that overall our staffing is climbing in churches. Yes. So I know you have some 
thoughts this is, on this. I'd love to hear those. Yeah, I've been tracking this number for many, many years, and this is the highest staffing number that I had seen ever uh, in the in the reporting in all the years I've been tracking this. So the ratio that came out this quarter was one full-time equivalent person for every 55 people in attendance. Um, and uh, we always get the question, what does that mean? Is that ministry staff only? Uh, does that include support staff? Um, we, we count everybody just to keep it apples to apples with all the churches that we're working with. And so uh, we'll also look not only at the number of full-time staff, but also get the equivalent full-time count based on all of the part-time staff to get to that number. And so um, it's alarming to me, Sean, honestly, uh, to see that number continue to go up. As Amy pointed out, commonly the churches um, that have higher staffing numbers have very low volunteer engagement. And we know volunteer engagement is critical to church health. It's uh, not only for regular attendance. If people are serving, they're more likely to attend. Uh, but we also know from some of our other data, they're more likely to invite friends. They're more likely to get into biblical community in smaller groups. Um, they're more likely to give financially to the church. I mean, there's just a, that ownership of serving is critical uh, to the overall health of the church. And so seeing those staffing numbers go up, I, th I, I get concerned because I know what that means for the overall health of the church. In addition to the fact, I mean, uh, Amy just highlighted for us, uh, we're big believers in that Ephesians 4 approach to ministry. We should be equipping God's people to do the work of God. And it seems ca counter to that biblical principle when we just hire staff to take on ministry responsibilities. The, the kind of warning that I want to give here is it doesn't surprise me, though, that the number is starting to creep up. I'm alarmed, but I'm not surprised. And the reason why I'm not surprised is we've had many years now of really strong economy. Uh, we've seen giving in churches continue to go up. We're going to get into some of those numbers here in a little bit as well. We've seen those numbers go up. And I think uh, as churches have gotten financially healthy through the years, I mean, it's been a long run, close to 10 years here. Um, it's just been easier for churches to hire people to get ministry done, particularly part-time staff. It's just easier to do that. I think it's the lazier approach <laughs> to, to getting ministry done because I know how much hard work it takes uh, to raise up volunteer leaders and to build volunteer teams. That is, it's just hard work to do that. It's much easier just to go hire somebody. Um, but uh, I do, I think it's a reflection of the strong financial condition um, that churches have experienced for many, many years. And uh, I never want to be the person that's praying for an economic downturn. But what we've seen in the past is when there's a downturn financially and, and giving starts to plateau and decline in churches, churches get a lot more savvier when it comes to not only hiring leaders that know how to equip um, and build volunteer teams, but there really is more of a focus in churches on strong volunteer engagement. And so I'm not praying for an economic downturn, um, but I think we should begin to prepare for that now, not only uh, for the churches to continue to be in a healthy financial uh, position, but mainly because I, I know how, how much healthier churches are when they shift from staff, staff engagement in ministry to really equipping volunteers to take on the ministry of the church. Yeah, that's helpful. I knew you had an opinion on that. I did. I, I tend to get on a soapbox when it comes to that, Sean. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's good. I like it. I like it. So, uh, Michael, a question for you. By the way, Sean, yeah, uh, let me just pour a little bit more fuel on this. Please. Um, a few months ago, we, we actually unpacked the numbers and looked at some key differences between growing churches and declining churches. And what we found is kind of shocking in a number of areas, but where there was um, some of the biggest disparity was when it came to staffing. Because what we found is this, declining churches were, had 40% more staff than growing churches. And so 
if if you have questions about the direction the direction I can't say that word the growth or decline of your church let's let's just go with that if you have questions about where your church is and uh, I think staffing is one of those areas that you need to consider and again I think it's all connected because churches are investing so much on staff and so many staff are carrying out the ministry it's pulling from how God really designed the church to, to engage, which is pe the people of God using the gifts that he's given them to carry out the ministry that the church is called to. All right, I'll stop after that. No, very good. That was, that was a great little extra there. Appreciate that. Uh, Michael, a question for you. So even with uh, this uh, significant staffing increase that we've seen, a span of care has risen in the church over the last year to one leader for every 23 people in attendance. So why is that a problem and what do you think churches can do about it? Yeah, um, uh, I think it's a problem because if, if that stat, if that um, one for every 23 in attendance is increasing, uh, it speaks to how fast we're developing leaders. Um, I think it speaks to how many leaders we're developing um, because if we're developing enough leaders uh, consistent with the pace of attendance growth, we should see that stat begin to shrink versus versus rise. Um, I think it's a few things that churches could do um, to, to shrink the span of care. One, I think is something what Amy said, um, pray and look inside of their congregation for not just gifted specialists, not just people who are good at the function, but people who have a leadership gift who can get great results, but get those results through people. Um, but as a local church leader working with local churches, I think one of the most healthiest things that a local church leader could do to um, get leaders in leadership positions is to get some fresh perspective, um, to get an outsider's perspective um, on their staffing, on their structure. And I say that because uh, uh, when we're inside of a church, when we're inside of a staff, we tend to develop relationships. We tend to get emotionally attached uh, to people. As ministry leaders, we want to shepherd people. We want to see the potential in people. It's just a part of, of how we're wired. But if we get an outside perspective, uh, it can bring some clarity. It can bring some objectivity uh, to, to the evaluation. And so sometimes the most healthiest thing that we could do is to not just look at it in a silo to not just look and evaluate our leaders by ourselves, but to bring in some outside eyes, to bring in a fresh perspective so that we can evaluate um, not only our structure, but the people inside of our structure in a more objective way. All right, guys, I'm ready to put you on the spot here. So in this last section today, I'm going to come to e uh, each one of you. Uh, because here, here's the deal, not only I know you all three have great ministry experience working in great churches, but you also as ministry consultants for the Unstuck Group get to serve many, many churches on a regular basis. And so I just want to get your perspective as you looked at the full report this quarter on some of the big issues that jumped out to you. I got to share my biggest one was the, the related to staffing. I don't know if some of you may want to piggyback on that comment, but Sean, I want to go to you first. As you looked at the report, uh, what, what jumped out to you? What were some of the key things that you thought, gosh, this is something we just need to be aware of uh, and maybe even raise some more questions in your mind? Yeah. Yeah, one thing that was, uh, was concerning to me that I saw is uh, one piece of data, one person will be invited to church every year for every two people who regularly attend. So specifically, a church of 100 people will have 57 first-time guests over a one-year period. And that, that's just not strong, a strong enough front door for our churches. Um, we encourage churches as we work with them to, to have at least a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you have 500 attenders over the course of a year, you need to see at least 500 new guests coming through your door. A part of this is because on average, we see about 15% attrition in churches year after year. Um, that attrition just comes from, you know, uh, there are going to be a few people who pass away. Um, there are going to be a few people who have to move. They move to another state and move out of the area for uh, work. There, there are probably going to be a few people who just decide not to go to church at your <laughs> church anymore. And, um, and so having a strong front door is critically important. I mean, if, you're, if you see 15% attrition over the course of the year, you need to see 
20% growth just in new attenders to have a 5% overall net growth, right? And um, gosh, this mission that we're on and reaching people for Jesus, going into all the world, uh, our front door in the church should be strong. So this is a little bit concerning to me, and I hope churches will start to dig into, if they're not seeing at least that one-to-one -one ratio, why is that? Uh, people aren't inviting others to our church, and we want, we want to know why and how we can help them. So uh, that, yeah, that, that data is a little concerning for me. I hope that creeps up next time we run this report. Okay. Amy, how about from your perspective? Well, I think I have to camp on the staffing one as well, Tony. <laughs> I, when I see these reports, I just recognize how much we're still lacking leaders and leadership positions at churches. And you know, I meet and work with many senior pastors, executive pastors, and I often say, man, if you just had two people like this person, you know, they've got a great leader. And what if you had two more? And you can just see the load um, off their shoulders lifted. Like, what if I actually had these leaders surrounding me? And so I do agree. I think someone said it earlier. It's great to raise up leaders within your church. People who don't have the specialty of maybe greeting, but the specialty of leadership, they're out there. But also, I would challenge people from your church who are leaders in other realms, challenge them to join the team as well. Sometimes it's good to bring a fresh leader in from outside. Sometimes we're afraid of that because we say, you know, church isn't a business, but businesses and churches are just both organizations, and organizations need leaders so that we can stay healthy and move ahead. And so, just don't give up looking for leaders, growing leaders, developing leaders, um, because those trends where I, you know they're, they're dipping a little bit, it's gonna take a little bit of work to get that flywheel going in your church. And it's a little relentless, but as you do that, you know, one little thing that I coach churches on is start rewarding your leaders for acting like leaders. Sometimes we reward mm -hmm. um, the staff on our church for doing certain things, and though that's a good thing. We should reward and acknowledge people for doing things. But if you start rewarding and acknowledging people on your teams for leading and for doing things that leaders do, take chances, give ministry away, I think you'll also see a little bit more repeat performance on those types of things. Including how much they're compensated, right, Amy? Well, that's tied to it, yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, we often say have fewer staff and pay them better. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Michael, how about your thoughts? What, what jumped out to you from this quarter's report? Um, <clears throat> the stat that jumped out at me had to do with the uh, church life cycle. Um, I think about 80% of the churches that we surveyed were sitting on the right side of the life cycle or were sitting on the downward slope, um, either in the maintenance phase um, or, or below. Um, so that then begs if 80%, eight out of 10 are sitting on the downward slope, um, it then begs the question, are we getting the results um, as local churches that we wanna get? Um, if not, then as local churches, we're right for change. I think it was Andy Stanley that said all of our local churches are perfectly designed to get the results that we're currently getting. And so as a church leader, as a pastor, as ministry leaders, we have to ask ourselves, am I satisfied with the results? Am I satisfied, as Sean said, with the front door? Am I satisfied with the number of leaders that we're raising? Am I satisfied with uh, the amount of people that are committing to push the ministry and the mission forward? Um, if I am, then hold down, always be open, but hold down to what I got. But if 80% are sitting on the downward um, slope of that life change cycle, then there's a lot of opportunity to look at ministry with fresh eyes and to bring some innovation and some change to what we're doing. That's good. And no, uh, no webinar would be complete without a quote from Andy Stanley too, Michael. So thanks for providing that today. <laughs> good thing. Good thing. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to shift gears. Uh, there have been a lot of good questions that have been coming in. Tiffany, thanks again for helping us with that. But before we jump to the Q&A, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things for you that uh, might be starting to think, you know, there's some key issues that are being raised in this conversation that we need to begin to address. And if, if that's you, um, there are a couple of opportunities I want to offer you. The first is this, we have reopened the Leading an Unstuck Church course. It's open now. Uh, we cover 12 topics, 12 core issues that we see in the churches that we engage with at the Unstuck Group. And many of those core issues are reflected in the topics, the conversations we've been having during today's conversations. In each of those lessons, we unpack 
for you, some of the strategies, some, some of the thinking that will help you and your leadership take your next steps around these core issues. We provide discussion guides, we provide exercises, and then we challenge you to some clear next steps that you can be taking in your leadership to help your ministry teams move forward in each of these areas. It's a self-paced course. Sean and I also provide coaching uh, through that experience, both online and through Facebook Live events, and we would love for you to be participate with that. If you wanna learn more uh, about jumping into that online course before enro enrollment closes, you can find out more at theunstuckgroup.com slash course. Secondly, uh, I've mentioned to you, uh, the four of us, we actually go to churches like yours, and we help uh, churches, hundreds of churches, uh, take their next steps in some of the very areas that we're talking about, and we'd love to serve your church as well. And if you want to find out more about that, you can start that conversation at the unstuckgroup.com website. Just click on the Get Started form, and uh, that's no commitment to move forward with coaching and consulting on site at your church. It'll just start the conversation so that you can find out what that's all about. And so we're going to shift uh, to the Q&A section. Amy's done this before. This is where I pick the toughest questions and I give them back to you rather than trying to respond to them myself. <laughs> so this is my favorite part of the webinars. Um, however, the first question I think I am going to take, um, it says, uh, these are great, by the way. Let me see. Uh, there's no name tied to this one, Tiffany, so I don't know who to blame for this tough first question, but here it is. Um, oh, wait, here it comes. Josh. All right. Thanks, Josh. Is, is there a concern of adverse selection? Okay, so here's someone that's taken a statistics course somewhere along the way. That's good. Um, uh, is, there, is there a concern of adverse selection in churches that, are uh, that you're taking data from? Uh, so uh, Josh is suggesting that it could be that churches that are struggling or are more inclined to take the vital signs assessment. And uh, again, I've referred, uh, I've referred earlier to the fact that when we unpack the data, we can see trends from churches that are both growing and churches that are declining. And in fact, uh, what we're seeing in the data that's being submitted for, for, uh, for vital signs, it's a mix of churches. We're seeing some very healthy churches that are not only seeing increase in attendance, increase in baptisms, increase in a lot of those ministry engagement numbers um, that we referred to earlier. We're also seeing some churches that are plateaued and declining as well. Uh, so hundreds of churches, it's a great mix of churches. And honestly, I think that's also a reflection of the work that the Unstuck Group does with churches. Um, though we're called the Unstuck Group, uh, we don't just serve stuck, stuck churches. We serve churches too that have experienced great health, great growth, and they're just trying to figure out what their, the next leg of their journey looks like as well. Uh, so it's, it really is a mix across the board of churches that are looking or that are completing vital signs. But Josh, you're correct. Our analysis, it's, it's, it's of the churches that have completed that assessment. So it's not a reflection of all churches out there. Uh, it's just a reflection of the churches that have actually taken the vital signs assessment. Uh, the next question, this is coming from Travis. Uh, it's related to staffing. And so Amy, I'm gonna give you this one since you oftentimes are working with churches around staffing issues. Travis's mm -hmm. question is this, what positions would you view as necessary as far as staffing is concerned? And do you view communications as an area where churches need to invest? I'm going to speculate that Travis is a communications director. <laughs> well, good, I love communications <laughs> directors. Uh, you know, critical roles depends on the size of your church, um, you know, how many you can afford, but you want to put a leader over the big engines within your church. So obviously you need a senior pastor, um, someone who's going to champion the teaching, the vision casting, uh, that type of thing. Um, I'm always an advocate of someone over your weekend, not a platform person, but someone who's off platform, who can coach everybody who brings the weekend service together and who can keep an eye on your front door. 
Um, I like a leader over the discipleship path, someone who's you know leading all of the next steps that people take beyond the weekend service. And then obviously you need operational leader. You need a leader potentially over family ministries, if and when you can afford it, but someone who's looking over all the birth through 18 or infant through 18 ministries that are happening. Um, and then communications, man, I, I probably can't say enough. I think the communications role is becoming more and more critical for churches. You know, it used to just be like print, web, you know, social media crept in, you know, 10 years ago. But these days, in fact, we just did a great podcast with Tiffany, our marketing director. Social media is beginning to be, and the website obviously is becoming a bigger and bigger front door for people uh, coming to your church. Nine out of 10 people will come to your website before they'll ever show up at your front door. Even if they're invited by a friend, they're going to go check everything out. Your website needs to be ready. But also, you know, the emerging strategy is really content marketing for churches to start putting content out beyond Sunday morning, um, put it out all week long, you know, try to answer the questions that people are asking. So a good strategic communications director, I think, is an incredible asset to churches out there. Tony, I don't know if you'd add anything. Yeah, no, I was just going to encourage you to give a plug for our podcast because we just covered that topic too recently trying to remember the name of the, the episode, but uh, Tiffany DeLucia, who handles that responsibility for our team at the Unstuck Group, was our guest mm -hmm. uh, for that podcast. And Amy and I interviewed her about some of the content marketing strategies she's engaging for our team. So uh, that's, uh, that's a, a podcast you may want to go back and listen to. It, uh, yeah, it's, your, it's why your church marketing might be stuck in 2004, I think. Yes, that's, that's yeah. right. That was late <laughs> July. Yeah. One of my favorite podcasts that we ever did. So you want, might want to go back and check that out. And it's not because I was on the podcast. It was because Tiffany was on the <laughs> podcast. All right. Uh, I, I, Sean, I think you're going to be the best person for this one. Uh, this is a question from Brian. Brian asks, uh, curious how most churches identify first-time visitors. We do it informally, which means that people can sneak by us. Yeah. They have sneaky people at their church. So how, how, do, how, do, churches, how do churches track first-time visitors? Well, you know what's interesting is every church has sneaky people. Um, yes. uh, sometimes when I'm working with a church, you know, we talk about this data about the front door and the number of people who are attending uh, for the first time as compared to your total attendance. And they say, well, we just, we just don't have a very good system right now for tracking first-time guests. And I just respond, mm, nobody really does. Uh, every church is learning in this area and growing in this area. So commonly what I see when I'm with churches is that at some point in the service, we'll mention that we're glad the new guests are here. And if they would just fill out a card and bring it somewhere else, we'll give them a gift, an unknown gift. We don't communicate what the gift is. It's just a gift of some kind. And I don't think that that's really effective. It, of all the churches I've worked with, they're still struggling with that strategy. Here's the thing that I've seen at really effective in just a small handful of churches. They will take whatever that gift is, that, you know, a, a bag of some sort with th some things in it, and they'll put it at the, the front door or all the entrances to their building. And when people walk in, they have a guest services team volunteers out there strategically in place to try to identify the new people. You know, when somebody walks in and they, they look kind of new, they're just kind of wandering around trying to find their way. These people are there just to identify who looks new. And so if somebody looks new, they'll engage a conversation. Is this your first time here? And if they say yes, a little bit more conversation, and they'll say, well, hey, we have a gift for you. And they actually give them this gift at the, at the front door as soon as they enter the church. And that gift is less of a, hey, we're just glad you're here gift and more of a marker for that person. Now, as they walk around for the rest of the day, Mm -hmm. The entire team is trained. When you see one of these bags, when you see this gift, whatever this marker is, we're going to be incredibly cordial to these people because it's their first time. We're going to figure out how we can best help and serve them because they're here for the first time. So I've only seen that in a small handful of churches, and I coach churches on this all the time. Take whatever that gift is, whatever that marker might be, put it at your front door so that you know the entire time that they're there that this is their first time and you can serve them better. I think that's been a more effective strategy with just uh, that smaller number of churches than is please fill out this card, come to some place later and get something that you have no idea what it is. So 
Uh, I hope I hope that helps, and I hope that helps some churches that are listening. Maybe you can tweak your strategy a little bit and find it more effective. That's good, uh, Michael. Any other best practices you would offer when it comes to first-time guests that you are either engaging at Faith Chapel or you're, you've seen at other churches? Anything else you would add? Um, yeah, I, I love Sean's uh, point. Um, I think uh, designated parking or just some designated space. Um, that would help either the parking team or first impressions or guest services team um, to help identify people like convenience, um, especially if I'm a guest. And so if there's um, some spaces in the parking lot that can be dedicated for me, if there's some signage um, that communicates out in the parking lot, hey, if this is uh, your first time or your guest, we're, we want to make it convenient for you. We want you to be a priority. Um, then that first impression, that guest team can um, serve in that area, monitor that area, and be proactive in reaching out and um, greeting those individuals. Um, so that's, that's another way that they could possibly be uh, proactive versus reactive. That's good. Uh, Joe asked a great question. How do you figure out whether the change in attendance percentages are from more people attending or more people increasing their frequency of attendance? And I don't think you can, uh, unless you are actually ta uh, uh, taking by name the attendance uh, in your services. And I know some of the smaller churches that we serve still do that. But once your church gets beyond a few hundred people, it's tough to do that and get consistency as far as attendance is concerned there. You really can't, I, I don't think. Uh, but any of you will have any other perspective on that? Uh, by the way, I think this is why it's important not only to measure attendance, but engagement. You need to start tracking both uh, because when you look at engagement, you should be able to put a name by somebody in their engagement and uh, whether that's groups or classes or serving opportunities or so on. Um, but when it comes to attendance, uh, that, that's a bit more of a challenge. Amy, you have that perplexed look though. Do you have another idea on that? No, I, I was thinking, please don't ask people to take attendance. That's not very guest friendly. No, um, but yeah. I, I was thinking the average person's coming 1.9 times a month. So unless you're doing something spectacular or just above and beyond that suddenly drawing so many of your people back to church more regularly, um, I would just tip towards if your averages are increasing that new people are actually coming. That's how I would interpret that. Yeah, and again, another reason to monitor first-time guests as well, because uh, that would be an indication that the attendance is from more people, not necessarily more frequency. More frequency is not a bad thing, though. If you figure out no. a way to encourage that, yes. you should do that. Um, all right, uh, let's see here. I'm going to move down uh, quickly, Perry. Uh, the number, the vital signs the churches uh, measure. Why do we measure general fund rather than total revenues? Again, it's to try to create an apples to apples analysis uh, because we do have churches that are in the middle of building campaigns or other focused stewardship efforts, and their total revenue would be higher, um, but which would put some of the metrics that we have related to staff to budget or so on, it would kind of make that out of whack. So just to create evil, even playing field uh, and look at apples to apples, we focus just on the general giving uh, for, for our stats. Uh, let's see, um, service time. Sean, I think I'm gonna make you the service time expert <laughs> here. Uh, and then we'll jump in to support you if we feel like your answer is not good. Uh, <laughs> Please. Scott, <laughs> Scott said, I'm curious about service times for churches who have more than three services, so good for them. We currently do three in the morning, I'm assuming on Sunday rather than Tuesday morning. And the middle service time is consistently the most popular, which is not a surprise. Uh, so uh, uh, here's, the, here's the bottom line question. Do you guys do three services in the morning and then a fourth standalone in the afternoon or mix of two in the morning and two at some other time? What do you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, uh, it sounds like their church has lots of options for people, which I think is the win. Um, the more fun. options you give people, uh, the more opportunity they have to attend your church on the weekend. And, and I just think that's, it's very important. I, I do, we still see across the country, the prime uh, service attendance time is still Sunday morning. 
and uh, somewhere between, you know, the hours of nine and noon. So I've seen churches who have tried, you know, like a 9 a.m., a 10.30, an 11.45 or 11.59. I, I know a church that does an 11.59 just so they don't have to say noon, you know. Um, but I think between nine and noon, the, the most services you're fitting in is three. So when you're thinking about that fourth service, I would start to think about um, – who are some people that we may be able to reach in our community that we haven't been able to reach because our services are only on Sunday morning? Uh, so at the church I attend, we have a Saturday night service. And it's still, a, uh, I know Saturday night has kind of gotten a bad rap, but it's still effective. Uh, we're the only service church in our area that ha offers a Saturday night service. And so there are uh, literally hundreds of people who attend a Saturday night service because either it works better for their schedule or they're working on Sunday morning or they have kids sports on Sunday, whatever it might be. Uh, I've seen other churches that are playing around with a weeknight uh, service as well, just testing the waters. And I think uh, just looking at the community around you, identifying what might be the best time for us to offer something to people we haven't been able to currently reach uh, would be a great way to go. And I think you need to also just kind of adjust your expectations for the win in this. Don't expect for this service to look like your middle service on Sunday, right? It's just not a fair expectation. Mm -hmm. We have to right size our expectation for what the service is and get really clear about who this service is, is uh, best uh, designed to reach. And if I think if we're clear about that, we'll be able to measure the win uh, better. So you guys, any other perspective from you guys on service times? I could be wrong, but I'm a big fan of Saturday night, but it's worked at our church and it didn't work like the, first day that we tried it, we just really hung with it. And all of our locations um, at Eagle Brook have Saturday night services now. And our four o'clock on Saturday is the second largest service of the weekend. So 11 o'clock on Sunday and then four o'clock on Saturday. And it's because in Minnesota, we have lots of sports. We have lots of activities that take up entire weekends. And people just love having the options to you know, jump back and forth on a Saturday or a Sunday. I know that's not true maybe around the entire country, but I think a lot of people start with the assumption we could never do a Saturday night, but it's been really fertile ground for our mission up here. Yeah, uh, down here in the Southeast, uh, where college football is a religion, uh, Saturday nights aren't a good option generally. Yeah. Uh, we haven't seen many churches in this part of the country make it work. But I do think this is an area where churches are going to have to come up with better solutions than just Sunday morning, mm -hmm. uh, because Sunday mornings are sacred for normal people. This is when they either sleep in or they're on the soccer field or the baseball field. And uh, it's, it's going to the lake, going to the ocean, whatever your, the mountains, whatever your deal is, they're sacred for normal people. And we're going to have to create alternatives, whether that's alternative service times during the week, which some of the churches we're working with are having great success with uh, services during weeknights, or again, online options for people too. So need to be considering that. All right, uh, Michael, your last question here. And then Amy, I have a great one for you. Um, are you ready for, ready for this, Michael? I'm ready. Um, uh, this, this is about raising the invite temperature in the churches. What are some of the best practices you're seeing to encourage people to invite their friends? And I'm assuming this question is more about weekend services than anything else, but it could be inviting to other aspects of ministry as well, I suppose. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, it's a question that in my consulting experience, um, just about every church that I personally work with has wrestled with some form um, of that question. A few thoughts come to mind. <clears throat> um, one, I think it has to be championed from the platform by the senior pastor. Um, just as any spiritual behavior that we wanna see reflected in the congregation has to be championed by the senior pastor and, and promoted from the platform. I think the behavior of invite um, to create a culture of invitation also has to be championed, but I think also um, it's one thing to tell a congregant what to do. Hey, bring people to church. I think it's another thing to resource that congregant to do what we're asking them to do. Um, one practical way that we could resource a congregant that wouldn't cost us a whole lot of money is just simply giving the congregants a heads up of what we're going to be teaching on or what topics we're going to be addressing. If, um, if I wanted to invite a friend to a local restaurant, it would um, 
it would mean more. I'd be able to sell the restaurant more if I've been to the restaurant, tasted the food, know what's on the menu. But if I've never been in or had no clue what was on the menu, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't feel as comfortable inviting a friend to that restaurant if I don't know what's on the menu. Mm -hmm. So um, every week we're serving spiritual food. Um, I think just letting the congregants know what's what's on the upcoming menu helps to resource and empower them to uh, invite their friends with confidence to the weekend services. That's good, Michael. All right, Amy, here it is. You get the last question of the day. Uh, so uh, let me see. Brian wrote, great question. I appreciate Amy's comments about contemporary services, and that is what we are. So uh, what, what, uh, but what about ancient, ancient future trends? And so he's talking about services that have hymns, creeds, kind of the more traditional elements. Um, I mean, there's, there's some conversation that that's where we're going. It's an ancient mm -hmm. future, it's kind of retro, and there's a segment of our population that is actually craving that type of worship experience. Um, I would say this, I've heard that as well. I've just never seen a successful version of it. I've never seen a growing church that's ancient future um, that I have worked with. I get the concept. And by the way, what I like about that concept is let's explain what we're doing. Let's give context to what we're doing and let people fully experience some of those traditions. Um, my husband did an Ash Wednesday service years ago, and he actually created a cool video that explained the symbolism and things like that. And it was a really meaningful service. Um, but I don't see any church regularly doing that in a really relevant way that's connecting people. I don't All know, right. Tony, have you? <laughs> Sean? I, okay, so I'm letting you in on an inside joke. Amy and I had that exact same conversation <laughs> yesterday. So, Brian, you asked the question that Amy and I were talking about yesterday. It's something we hear people talking about and writing about and theorizing about, but neither one of us have ever seen it actually work anywhere. So there you go. That's All true. right. So thanks again for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, again, we'll email you all the resources that were mentioned today, including the full version of the uh, fourth quarter Unstuck Church report. And then we're, uh, there were uh, many more questions that were submitted in today's conversation that we were not able to answer in the live conversation. And we will try to respond to those to you in future articles and uh, through social media. Uh, but, and you know, just because we're done today doesn't mean you can't stop, stop uh, you have to stop uh, submitting questions. I'm having a talking issue here. Uh, feel free to do that. Uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, just use hashtag Unstuck Church and we'll try to reply uh, to your questions there as well. And again, if there's anything the Unstuck Group team can be doing to support you, to help your church get healthier, take your next steps, reach more people, help more people meet Jesus and take steps of faith, we want to help you do that. And you can take your first step to engage with us at theunstuckgroup.com uh, and just click on that Get Started form and we'd love to start a conversation with you as well. Thanks for joining us today. Sean, thank you. Michael, thank you. Amy, thank you. Tiffany and Caroline, appreciate your help as well. And thank you again for participating. We'll see you again soon.